Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Hello and welcome to the latest look back at talking heads over the past week. Increasing the value of the TT to the Manx economy, an independent health regulator and a planning inquiry for the Douglas Promenade refurbishment plans were all popular topics on the programme this week. But we'll start with another popular topic, the use of cannabis for medicinal purposes. Stu Peters takes up the story. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. Should cannabis be decriminalised if used for medicinal purposes? The use of cannabis for medical reasons remains an ongoing political debate in many corners of the world. Across the water, MPs last month opposed plans to uh, legalise the production, sale and use of the drug. During question time recently, the island's health minister said he didn't oppose cannabis being used to treat patients as long as it's on medical advice and supplied by a reputable pharmaceutical company. Chief Minister Alan Bell last year called for a rethink in the way nations deal with certain illegal substances. Should cannabis be decriminalised for medicinal purposes, or could that just be a step in the wrong direction when it comes to the island's policy on drugs? Is it something that should be at least considered, or is it an idea that should be dismissed altogether? Tell us what you think about this. Um, Do you think Alan Bell has his priorities all wrong? The island's under the cosh trying to pay the most expensive gas and electric prices in Europe, and all he cares about is people smoking pot and same-sex marriage okay uh could have a few cannabis cafe shops in douglas it would encourage tourism also if we grew it here it makes very good cloth rope hemp seed is good for you and hemp oil is sold in health shops would also protect kids from skunk if mild stuff was readily available i was using cannabis for osteoarthritis of the lower spine i bet that's a horrible thing um i grew it myself found myself with a criminal record after proving to the police and the attorney general there was no criminal intent it should be available at the chemist just like any other drug or let me grow my own and save the nhs a fortune Uh, and my GP tacitly agrees. Yes, he can't officially agree with that, I don't suppose, because it would be illegal. Um, But I'm sure he's sort of uh, given you the wink on it. Tom says, please don't add another legal drug to our already addictive island. People need to get a life, not an extra way of getting high. Well, that's a valid point of view, Tom. Uh, I often worry about people who... uh, Uh, go out for a drink and end up getting absolutely sort of slaughtered uh, on booze. Uh, And you just think, well, you know, what's so wrong with your life that you need to get so out of it on such a regular basis? But, you know, unless you're walking in somebody else's shoes, you can't really say. Um, So I I can understand that point of view. But I think that of all the things that people could take as a recreational uh, enhancer, mood enhancer, I would think that cannabis is probably the most benign. Now, I stand to be corrected on that. Like I said to Chris earlier on, I know that uh, Shelley Stanley, um, who ran what was Dash, uh, said to me a couple of times that, you know, it's not so much that it can be a gateway, but it can cause awful problems in later life, especially young people who use it habitually. Um, it can cause all sorts of psychological problems later on in life. So that's obviously one of the issues that needs to be looked at as far as this is concerned. To the lines, and let's have a chat with Tommy about this. Hi, Tommy. I've become like, more uh, liberal like minded now, Stu, on this. You know, as it, it was a bit hard, hard line about it before, but I think it is... Uh, time it was introduced uh, Stu, you know, like, because uh, I do believe it does uh, bring relief to a lot of uh, pain sufferers, uh, Stu. Yeah, it seems you know. that that's the case, Tommy. You know, a lot of people oh. get in touch about it and say that it is great for certain conditions, MS yes, particularly, uh, I think. Exactly. And then they go on to prescription uh, drugs, uh, uh, Stu, which can be equally as as, uh, as dangerous. Uh, oh, of course when, they can, when, yeah. when, I, when, me, uh, when me dog pulled me over in, in uh, January uh, Stu, and I had a really bad fall, and uh, I had to go up the A&E next day, and they confirmed it wasn't, I knew it wasn't broken, but they said, you badly damaged all your ligaments and your tendons, so they said, that's all you could do, but you couldn't do anything else, so they gave me a prescription, and I looked at it, and it was for 100 uh, co-codamol. Yeah, they can be and pretty strong, I think. Oh, watch, do they, they, they blow your they blow your head off, mate, <laughs> and they were, the, they were the strong ones, they were the 30 uh, stroke uh, 500. Right. And when I read the instructions on the on the prescription that to take, it says take two four times a day. Yeah. Well, well, I've had them before, Stu, and I, I knew if I carried that out to the prescription, I, I knew I'd be walking around like a zombie, Stu. <laughs> Honestly, I, and all I did was take one because they're highly addictive, there, Stu. You know, cold, right. cold and well. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. You, you see, you go from illegal drugs onto legal uh, uh, drugs, and and there's a little fine line down the middle, Stu, isn't there? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I suffer from fibromyalgia, says the Manxman. It's a horrible illness. 
in which there are countless debilitating symptoms. One of the main ones is severe chronic pain, which is constant and excruciating at times. Cannabis would help me beyond belief. Imagine being seriously ill, knowing that there's a drug that could help you, but your government won't allow its use. My doctor has hinted at me uh, to use it, so I would if I could. Legalise it now, says the Manxman. Thank you very much for your comments. If cannabis was legalised, would it carry the same health warnings about impaired judgment when using machinery and driving? Yes, I'm sure it would. Or are we just going to have stoners driving and killing others on the roads? But hey, let's not worry because the stoner will be dead from cancer sooner or later, says Pip. The answer to your call asking how to administer the Channel 5 programme Cannabis on Trial showed and endorsed the use of a volcano vaporiser. There are no carbons inhaled at all and the safest way to take the substance. Why can't a GP prescribe or give some sort of permit to grow and self-medicate? OK. Uh, massive tourism benefits, winter weed breaks will fill hotels and generate millions says uh, Rudolph. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's what the Chief Minister's got in mind. Uh, there is a high number of suicides after taking skunk and it's hard for the families to come to terms with. Any change in the law would be hard to police to keep the skunk out. My brother-in-law took his own life for no apparent reason after taking skunk. Well, I'm sad to hear that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think cannabis should be compulsory. Never heard of anybody smashing the house up after a joint. Uh, my boss definitely needs it. <laughs> Mr Bell and yourself are wrong. OK. Prolonged use of cannabis can cause mental illness. If you legalise this, the next thing people would say is, I need heroin or cocaine for an illness. The Isle of Man would regret this decision. Um, well, people do get heroin for an illness, don't they? Prescribed, of course. The Nation Station. Men's Radio. Is it time for a decision to be made over the proposed Douglas Promenade refurbishment? There have been numerous consultations and revisions to plans over the past few years, and the next step is a public inquiry later this month. The £21 million makeover of the area is being proposed by the Department of Infrastructure. So should a definite decision be made on whether to proceed with the plans, or is even more time needed to consider the various options available when it comes to the refurbishment? And who should ultimately make the decision either way? Uh, God help us! Cliffy. How long is this pantomime going to drag on, says Cliffy? Just get on with the damn job. It's going to take years to finish anyway when the thing ever starts, if it ever starts. <laughs> they need to spend money on the wall and sea defences on the promenade before uprooting everything and it's fo and it falling into the sea. Retarmark the current surface and put the money into sea defences. It's like putting new double glazing in a house where the foundations of the house are unstable, says Elaine. Good thought. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, the Victorians must be spinning in their graves with laughter at our inability to get anything done. I dread to think what infrastructure we would have now if they'd had to put up with all this red tape, says Alan. Stu, I think that government have made so many mistakes in the past that they're scared to make decisions now. Please just get on with the prom, says Bill. I think you're right, Bill, and I sometimes think about all these consultations that we have, that it really it's just a, a, a get-out clause for the politicians. So if the, if they've had a consultation on something that goes horribly wrong, they can say, well, we did ask what people what they thought, so we've only done what people wanted us to do. Not our fault. You, you asked for it, so we've done it. I do worry about that a little bit, but, uh, uh, yeah, you might have a point there. Just cover it in loose chipping, says Mark. That's how they repair most roads in the island. Well, that is one suggestion. Uh, just resurface it, and I think the minister said, well, that's only going to last for a, a number of years before it needs to be redone. But still, the maths of that seem to uh, indicate that that would still be a far cheaper option than the £21 million scheme. Whether it would be as nice is a different thing altogether. To the lines, let's have a word with Wilf in Ramsey. Hi, Wilf. I don't care where they put the horse tram, which side of the road, I think they should stay where they are anyway. Okay. But I'm not bothered. But the thing is, when it goes to planning, and if they have to bring an independent inspector in, or they tell you they do, and his decision can then be overruled by Phil Garn. So where do you go from there? Well, that, this is one of the things that's always uh, confused me about the planning system. You know, if you bring an independent inspector in and then don't listen to what he says, then why bother getting him in the first place? I think what yeah, Phil Gorn was right saying... Yeah, I think for what Phil Gorn was saying is that at least he puts together all the arguments and then the Council of Ministers can look at it uh, and, and uh, you know, have a better idea of what the issues are. I suppose. Yeah, but what's the point? What's the point of a, of an inspector at yeah. all? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I agree with you. It's not expense. For nothing. Yeah. All right, Will. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I do share that point of view. I think. Let's go to uh, line four, and we've got Kay on. Hello, Kay. 
Oh, good afternoon, Stu. Oh, yeah. I'd like to say they should just get on with it. <laughs> just do it, yeah. Do the prom. <laughs> it's cost... I don't know how much it's cost for these plans to be drawn up. Yeah. But if they shelve it, like they've shelved this thing with the TTs, which has cost us 270-odd thousand, yeah. the horse trams are losing £250,000 a year. Yeah. Now, if you were in business, you wouldn't run it. No. Nope. You know, get rid. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they, they just... I don't know what it is. They leave things here till they fall in a part of the seams, and then they start to do something. Yes. You know, they don't look at it when they think, oh, it's deteriorating a little bit, we'll do something. They just leave it till it's falling to bits. And we're all supposed to be in this together. I don't know where they're getting all this money from. It amazes me. Yeah. You know, the rest of us are here suffering because we've got to pay extra gas prices. Uh, well, no, we won't bother with that. We'll pass the gay rights. We'll pass this. You know, we'll all be old age pensioners smoking dope. <laughs> you know. And, and Eddie Tier doesn't like old age pensioners, so, I mean, we won't be able to put our gas on anyway, so we'll probably all die of, of hypothermia anyway, so that'll be a less number we'll have to worry about. You're a happy little ray of sunshine today, Kay, aren't you? <laughs> Which side thought, of the bed did you get out of? <laughs> I just thought I'd put my view, and uh, that's how I feel. All right. <laughs> and most amusing it was as well. Thank you very much for calling today. Uh, I agree with the idea to spend the money on sea defences just tarmac the prom walkway if needed. For Kevin's sake, don't spend more money on stone paving. Also, is a daft idea to take away the crossings to try and increase traffic speed. If there were better bus facilities at the imaginary bus station, that could take a bit of traffic off the road. All the best. Uh, let's go back to the lines. We've got John on. Hi, John. I mean, this has been going on for so long, hasn't it? It's just getting ridiculous. <laughs> Forever. Yeah, yeah. I went through to Castletown the other day and I noticed that the, um, the redoing the road in Castletown Square is still going on. I mean, I don't know what the overrun on that is. It must be at least six months. Now, I worked out that you could fit maybe 100 Castletown Squares into the prom. <laughs> yes. So effectively, if that overruns the same extent, and I'm sure it will, They'll be, still be doing it in 50 years' time. <laughs> yeah, a thousand-year yeah. reign from the Department well, of that's Infrastructure. that's right. You know, it'll become a, a permanent tourist <laughs> attraction. Maybe they can get tourists over to come and actually help help on the... You know, they'll, they'll, they'll find archaeology and they'll find Viking burials or something and they'll have to, you know, get the archaeologists in to dig up dig up all the rest of it. Well, well it, could, you know? it could be one of those interpretive centres, couldn't it? You know, the, the Manx yeah. Road experience, come and build oh, the roads right. yeah, for us. Build, they could build a permanent cover which moves about an inch a year, you know, and it's sort of... <laughs> Yeah, that'll do. I think that's probably the best suggestion today. Thank you, John. Stu, so being off the rock for a couple of months, you're t uh, taking comments before I left about the prom, and still we're banging on about it. It's like Groundhog Day, uh, uh, same old, same old, uh, different day. They need to pull the fingers out and get on with it, says John. I think a lot of people probably agree with that. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Should the island have an independent health regulator? The latest attempt to introduce one has been quashed by the House of Keys. Yesterday, South Douglas MHK Kate Beecroft made a bid to secure leave to introduce a bill which would see the creation of the post. It's not the first time Mrs Beecroft has attempted the move. A motion on the issue at the July sitting of Timwall was voted down by the court as well. The latest bid was defeated by a wide margin, with many members arguing that the cost would be too high. Health Minister Howard Quayle admitted he was open to the idea, but believes the timing isn't right. He said the idea could be revisited after a review of the health service by the West Midlands Quality Review Service concludes. Is the island in real need of an independent health regulator? Or with the ongoing review of health services, could the creation of the post at the present time just be a waste of time and money? Stu, Mr Bell's government will never allow an independent health regulator. Thank goodness we have Kate Beecroft to protect our welfare state, says Simon. Stu, yes, the Isle of Man should absolutely have an independent review body, despite Mr Quayle's upbeat all his OK statements. Exactly the opposite is true. Staff are leaving in droves, like their police colleagues. Pension interference, bullying, lack of leadership are but a few reasons. Operations cancelled till after Christmas. Why? That from S... Dave called. Yes, it's about time we had one. The amount of people who go across for the Isle of Man, uh, from the Isle of Man for treatment, when they get there, the records haven't come with them, so the appointment's a waste of time. It happens so many times, really. And I had a procedure about eight years ago. I spoke to a consultant about it, and he said if the surgeon couldn't do it through keyhole surgery, then he was a dinosaur. When I booked in, I elected to have keyhole surgery, but they said nobles didn't do it. I don't think they know uh, either. 
Right, OK. We've got Jeff on line four who'd like to have a chat about this. Hello, Jeff. I can speak from experience because I was in Nobles for about 10 days last month as a patient. And I think the staff, while they are um, uh, excellent individually, are um, rather running around in circles. Um, and there's uncertainty about various meetings and to which extent they are required to attend them, the uncertainty about timing of uh, meal breaks, and there's also a strange device which you're supposed to um, press to summon immediate assistance or aid, but you can press it and press it and press it, and nothing happens because about um, a dozen patients are uh, queuing up for this aid, and there are only one or two people to actually provide it at that time. So it's a totally misleading, really, to give you the idea yes. that you can get immediate attention. And in general, um, staff are um, concerned. There's a lot of ward um, politics going on, a lot of disputes over who does what and when, and they are rather... Uh, running around sometimes in with uncertainty. Individually, they are very kind and um, caring, and the food is marvellous, uh, which is something that always attracts me. But I do agree with Kate that an independent regulator would be a very good idea, and a notion that perhaps this could be shared uh, with Jersey or other jurisdictions, and you need necessarily have a sole person for the Isle of Man, is makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think putting it off until maybe after the next election is really leaving a lot of people in uncertainty, doubt, and a rather confused position yeah. um, there. OK. Yeah. Some good points there, Jeff. Thank you very much for your call. I have to say, I mean, I don't have a down on the health service. I think that they do a cracking job. And there are some little areas within the uh, within Nobles, within the health service in the Isle of Man, that I think are fantastic. Good afternoon, Stuart. If Alan Bell had the slightest shred of gumption about him, gumption, what a cracking word, <laughs> he'd have made Mrs B health minister instead. All he seems interested in is surrounding himself with toadying yes men. Do you think... I don't get that impression at all. And we don't know. Maybe Mrs B wouldn't want to be a health minister. I don't know whether or not she's ever been asked. Mrs B would be great for the role, says Jeff, holding shoddiness, of which there appears to be plenty in the health service, to account, not being afraid of tackling the issues which many people have. OK, good point, thank you. Bring back the ward matron, says Dave. Yeah, OK. Stu, I've been given to understand that the majority of junior doctors, i.e. non-consultants and GPs at Nobles, are locums. If this is true, there are two questions that immediately need to be addressed. How much is this costing and why is the island unable to attract full-time medics? I think the minister's fiddling while Rome burns, says Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, government needs to listen to Kate B so that we can be confident in the NHS. The government is not being active over this, says somebody else. Stu, yes, we do need this additional independent monitoring. Just ask the staff. Mr Quayle must have rose-coloured specs, severely understaffed, administration in disarray. One nurse was struggling to attend to eight patients and asking the family of the patients to speak to their MHKs. There's no fiscal excuse as the government's wasting much-needed funds. People must know the morale and conditions for the frontline workers is unacceptable. Something has to be done now, says Ali. Thank you, Ali. I didn't realise it was that bad. A couple of years ago, I was in hospital for an operation, says Rob. 90% of the care was good, but there was an occasion when a nurse tried to give me the wrong dose of medication. I had to explain to her that what was written on the standard label isn't always the dose that's being prescribed. It wasn't really a problem for my condition, but it could have been for someone on other medication. It does need a regulator to keep standards high. Also, the cleanliness of hospital. I think they should let the staff work on that because they know which areas need to be addressed. A regulator should be appointed immediately to work in parallel with the review people so that continuity can be maintained, says Doug. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I suppose, Doug, yeah. Uh, I think that it might be as well to wait, like the Minister says, and see what the uh, the review uh, people say and then get a regulator in on the back of that. But, you know, your, your point of view is perfectly valid. Maybe they ought to work side by side for a while. Of course we require a regulator. Our health service is nothing short of a third world 
service. Having had to use the service for the past six months, I'm appalled. It's not just the hospital, but all areas, including the GP service. It appears that apathy rules, says Sue. I'm sorry that you've had a bad experience, Sue. If people did the jobs properly, why do we need a regulator? Surely the highly paid managers who implement policy and budget are capable. If not, they deserve to be sacked, as would happen in the private sector. However, the person ultimately responsible is the health minister, and he or she should not try to pass the book by bringing in a regulator. Just do your job. Well, in fairness, it's not the health minister's job to run the hospital, is it? Uh, they have political responsibility, but the actual nuts and bolts of it uh, is not down to them. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. You're listening to the latest Talking Heads podcast, featuring highlights from the programme over the past week. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Is the new charging structure for gas customers more transparent than the old one? The Celtic League has waded into the arguments over the changes. It's received a detailed response from the Office of Fair Trading about the recent restructuring of tariffs by Manx Gas. The letter from Chief Officer Mike Ball also included a copy of the gas agreement between Manx Gas and the OFT, Treasury and Department of Economic Development. It was posted in full on the Celtic League Facebook page. There are concerns that the tariff restructuring is in fact a price rise as the winter month approach. Does the new tariff structure make it clearer what customers will have to pay and what they're being charged for? Or is it just a roundabout way of charging people more? What do we think about it? Let's go to the lines. Our first caller is Stephen. Hello, Stephen. My view is that whilst this is an important uh, issue, the raising for some people of the standing charge, I think that's almost like rubbing salt into the wound. I hope it won't take away from the main concern that that was on the minds of everyone before this latest uh, charge was uh, uh, increased is the simple price of gas consumption on the island. And I think that Mr. Karen MHK raised this in a question last week or the week before where he said, gave some figures and the figures seem to say that the gas, the cost of the average cost of gas for a consumer was almost double on the island. Yeah. So for me, I think that, that that is where we should remain with our focus. And I think he said, well, if if anybody wishes to contact the OFT, I mean, he, I think he was referring to parliamentarians yeah. to ask for an inquiry to see how does this can how does this cost compare with other jurisdictions. I would hope that some MHKs will uh, ask for an inquiry, because I think we need to know. Let's go to line three and talk to Diane in St John's. Hello, Di. I think I've got my head round this gas, because we had our... Mr Boot came round and, you know, helped me to go through it, and I got my... And it's based on last year's bill. Now, this is what's bothering me. Last year, I used 6,006 kilowatts. Yeah. All right? Now, with the charge of 50 pence a day and the direct debits and all this crap, I will gain about two pounds in the year. Oh, good. Right. We'll go out on a night on that, Stu. Yeah. <laughs> we can share a pint with two straws. Yeah. If, for argument's sake, say this winter is very, very cold, yeah. and I go above 6,000, and I go above... 7,500. I will then be paying 63 pence a day. So next year we'll assume I'm paying 63 pence a day. Yeah. But it's a mild winter. And so I don't use very much gas. Which means I will get less discount off because the price of the gas has gone down. Yeah. So in, theory, in, in that year... I will be paying more because I'll still be paying 63 pence a day. I mean, you know, let's face it, the job of Manx Gas is to return as much profit as they possibly can for the shareholders. So uh, I would think it's a work of genius. But, I mean, it's our government who regulate it. Government departments have have, uh, sat down with Manx Gas and concluded that this is fair. So, you know, I think if uh, if anybody's going to be cross about this, it should be at our government rather than at Manx Gas. Their job is to make profits for the shareholders. Yeah, you know, and obviously I'm going to watch what gas, because if I think that I'm going to go above this 7,500, I'm going to have to turn it off a night. Yeah, In the probably. depth of winter. And I'm a pensioner. Lots of hot water bottles and an electric blanket, not to be used at the same time, of course. Well, I'll get the wood-burning stove going more, I Oh, think. there you go. That's the answer. We've got Jill. Hello, Jill. 
I don't understand why some people are confused by the information leaflet they sent out. Okay. Because it it, it shows you what, what your gas consumption was. I don't use a lot. I'm very careful when I put the heating on. Yeah. And I'm what you call a low consumer. I'm under 5,000, whatever that is. Yeah, good for you. So I read along the line and the charge isn't changing and the standing charge isn't changing. So I'm not going to be affected. Hmm. And we did have some cold snaps last winter, you know, and I had the, I'm very careful when I put it on. I dress warmly in the house. Yeah, sure. Do you know what I mean? I don't have the house hot like some people do. There's no need for it. I would have thought that it'll change one way or another, but uh, I'm certainly not an expert on it. I mean, I read the leaflet as well. <laughs> and uh, to be honest with things like that, it's just a case of, well, you know, uh, they'll send me a bill and I can either pay it or I can't. But uh, I'm fairly sure that, I mean, the whole sort of fundamental basis of the charges are going to change, Jill. So I've got Sheila on the line. Hello, Sheila. Um, I'm just reading up to advise people to read the gas meters themselves. Oh, right, OK. Um, the last quarter one I got... Bear in mind it was for a summer sort of thing. Yeah. It was over £200. Why? And it was more than my winter bill. So I checked the meter myself and they'd overcharged me by 200 units. Wow. Which came back at about £170. Yeah, crazy. And so it was an estimated bill, was it? No, it was an actual reading. Oh, it was an actual reading. That was the thing. Right. If it had been estimated, I just thought that would have been easier to prove. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow... um. I wrote to them saying, you know, I was horrified about it and it would have been awful if somebody who was in a very vulnerable position of course. had received a bill like that. Oh, it's a heart stopper, that, isn't it, to get well, a big it was. bill? My initial reaction was, it's going to be a long, hard winter. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, that's good advice, Sheila. Thank you for that. So, uh, yeah, it's probably good advice for all of us. I'm just trying to think where my gas meter is. I think it's in a, a box on the wall. Let's have a quick word with Eddie. Hello, Eddie. Basically, it, the price of our, our electricity and gas is ridiculous. Yes. I've just received my electricity bill for the summer, and it was dearer than the one for the winter. <laughs> Plus, it's gone up now. Your standing charge, they're all jumping in on their standing yeah, charge. It's yeah. 15p a day now. Crazy. And, I, and it's just like, all right, we won't put the charge up for you. We'll just put another 3p a day on on your standing charge. It's just, it is, I mean, the whole principle of it is just nuts, isn't it? As a consumer, you can see why a company would do it, but as a consumer, I mean, it's. I'm just amazed that, you know, it seems to be the way that these things are done. What about the massive cost the taxpayer paid for the gas pipe and conversion? We're being charged twice again, says Kit the other. Gas prices in Jersey supplied by same company as Manx Gas. Unit price is 11.9 pence a unit. Standing charge 34 pence a day. France, 1.9 pence a unit. And the gas is piped in from France. Wow. This one from Chris. Hi, Stu. All we seem to hear from Manx Gas and even Alan Bell is that prices will be going up by a maximum of 25 quid a year. Am I missing the point or are gas prices considerably lower than they were even a year ago? Prices should be going down, not up or staying the same, says Chris. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Have you noticed an increase in interest in the TT Festival? Latest official figures show visitor numbers to the TT and Festival of Motorcycling are growing steadily. A survey by Ireland-based Research Offshore has revealed that this year's TT races attracted 42,000 visitors. That's up 11,000 over five years. Meanwhile, the rebranded MGP has apparently hit the spot too, with visitor numbers up since 2009 by 68% to 15,000 people in 2015. Together, the events have generated almost £28 million for the Manx economy, with the Exchequer benefiting to the tune of £5 million this year compared to £3 million in 2009. Have you noticed an increase in visitors to both events? Are those who do come over happily willing to take to part with their money while they're here? Is the potential to attract more people over for both events? Pure fantasy figures from the DED, says somebody else. Um, I think that's unfair. Now, you might feel that about it. That's, you know, in your opinion, pure fantasy figures. But the, the, they do have figures that I expect to probably cost a lot of money to produce. Um, so I don't know whether or not you can question them. It's, it can only be a feeling about whether or not the place is busier or not. Uh, or based on data. Derek says, any headline figures provided by the government in the last number of years can very rarely be backed up. Do the carriers back up these figures? 
I don't know the mechanism by which this research firm has, has done the uh, the numbers, but I'm, I'm guessing that they must have spoken to the carriers. It might be wrong. When you look at past pictures of the TT, when the steam packet had seven or so ships doing a shuttle service in the 1970s, present ones seem quietish in comparison. Yes, more bikes can come over due to the type of vessels. Is this where they claim a 40% plus increase? Let us see actual comparative stats, says Derek. Well, like I say, I'm guessing that they've probably not got any uh, prior to, you know, uh, fairly recently. So I don't know that they could do that. Uh, this is the same market research company who said that TT365 on the radio was an amazing success. Lee said soon his men, men did. I'll not re respond to that, I don't think. Stu, the figures for the classic TT are false. They said that 15,000 visitors this year, only 9,000 in 2009. What they have not said, this is interesting, is that in 2009, 9,000 visitors were here for two weeks. Now they're only here for the bank holiday weekend. Ask any hotelier. They've got more bed space now than six years ago. That's a very interesting thought, actually, isn't it? Uh, what else? Um, what a load of old pony. <laughs> the figures are made up of statistics in the user's favour. The TT in 1978 and 1979 had over 80,000 that came on six boats that operated a shuttle. Well, yeah, you can't really compare with them, though, can you? The beer was dreadful then, though, but it was cheap, says Dave. OK, well, I've got the actual figures here. And uh, uh, visitor numbers, uh, Festival of Motorcycling in, 19, in 2009, 8,900. Uh, up to 15,000, so that's a 68% increase. TT in 2010, 31,000, up to 42,000 in uh, this year, a uh, 35% increase. But the economic benefit, and whether or not they've just interpolated based on the number of visitors or whether or not they've actually looked at this differently to come up with these numbers, 83% increase in economic benefit from the Festival of Motorcycling, uh, up from 3.5 million to 6.4 million. TT up from 13.6 to 21.4, so that's up 57%. And they're now saying that, uh, uh, yeah, it's actually uh, putting 27.8 million quid into uh, the island. And out of that, the Exchequer earns something like 5 million. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's a worthwhile chunk of money. That's up from three million, so uh, just under two million quid increase as far as the exchequer is concerned. Television coverage has been a huge factor, says somebody else, in broadening the TT's appeal. Up until 1992, you only had highlights available on video. Yeah, I think that the TV coverage that we've got at the moment is having a big impact. Uh, I think no more over for TT, thinks Roy. Oh, okay. So you, you do realise 96.35 percent of all statistics are made up, don't you? Says he. <laughs> yes, I do, Ian. Let's face it, a third of the 28 million will be for the steam packet. Yes, it's busy, but only over the main weekend. OK. Uh, there's a saying, Stu, figures don't lie, but liars do figures, <laughs> says Mickey. <laughs> Couldn't comment on that, I don't think. Uh, there are a couple of limiting factors stopping more people getting here. The steam packet prices and lack of beds. Yeah, uh, I think you're probably right. Uh, the question is, what do you do about it? I mean, short of nationalising the steam packet... Uh, I don't know about the prices. I mean, if if uh, if you've been to any sort of world class motorsport event, uh, then you were properly gouged for everything. You know, burgers for a fiver or whatever. So, uh, I don't think we probably compete terribly badly in terms of prices. Once people are here, yes, they're probably more expensive than for the rest of the year. But uh, people are making hay while the sun shines, I suppose. Traders, why not ask Mister Skelly to organise an international TT series and waste some money? Says Albert. Albert. Now behave yourself. So if DED have been so successful in increasing support and profit, why do we need a private promoter to share these profits? Says Pauline Ramsey. Michael, who's a hotelier, says, in response to your correspondent about TT figures, our practice week at the Welbeck is now busier than it's ever been though he or she is correct in that the stays are shorter, but many are just happy to be able to find some piece of the atmosphere in action. Good. TT will never seem as busy as in Douglas as it used to because of the lack of hotel rooms. It means that they spread further around the island than they used to be, but we could let our place out about ten times, and it's a source of frustration for the visitors that they can't find accommodation. I'm sure it is. On the other hand, should he or she be talking about the TT Classic MGP, then he or she is quite correct in that many now do just come for the weekend, though the demand is incredible and once again much time is spent negatively answering telephone and email inquiries 
that's awful if you're in business and you've got people who want to come and spend money with you and you've got to turn them away. However, despite the main focus being a, a around the weekend, we had a better MGP than last year and it seems that advanced bookings are once again stretching towards the end of the week. Just one hotel is experience and I have no hard figures to manipulate for or against the government. Best wishes from Michael at the Wellbeck. Thank you, Michael. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. That's it for the latest look back at Talking Heads. Thanks as ever to everyone who contributed to the programme. If you'd like to get involved in the discussion, call, text or email between midday and 2pm on weekdays, or share your thoughts at any time on the Facebook page. That's Talking Heads with Stu Peters. You can listen back to each day's programme in full using the on-demand section of the Manx Radio website. And that website's also where you'll find an update of what's being discussed on the programme each day. You can keep up to date with that information by liking the Facebook page or following Stu Manx on Twitter. And if there's anything you think we should be discussing on the programme, let us know by emailing talk at manxradio.com. But that's it for now, so until next time, goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.